Let's go. Uh, okay. Um, well, it's our great pleasure today to have uh, Yuri Dvorka here at TTU. Uh, Yuri is currently an assistant professor at New York University, Department of Electrical and Computer Engineering. And before that, uh, Yuri was a PhD student and he got PhD at the University of Washington in 2016. It's a great pleasure to have Yuri here. And stay Thank yourself. you. Thank you. Uh, first of all, I want to say thank you to so many people to have uh, invited me here, and it's a great privilege to be here in this power group because uh, even before my brother joined you, I read a lot of papers published from here. <laughs> so um, today I'm going to be talking about demand response flexibility and how we can learn more information about it so we can use this resource very efficiently. And actually, the reason why we are interested in this topic at the New York University is because right here, this blue Soviet type buildings. It's one of the buildings which is designated for faculty housing and this building suffers from a lot of inefficiencies so uh, it's now part of the program to improve sustainability of our campus by improving uh, processes in that building including demand response and efficient charging of electric vehicles. But in more general scope I would like to talk about the future of electric power distribution and the first thing that I would like to attack is the word of distribution itself. Because the distribution system, they're no longer about distribution. If you go to any kind of dictionary, English dictionary, you will see that the word distribution itself has the following meaning. That someone takes something in bulk in one place and then disseminate this in smaller quantities downstream. Uh, it has a meaning in a general sense, in law sense, in a business sense, but now it's not applicable for power system because we have this wonderful distributed energy resources that can help us to avoid the whole distribution process and to enjoy the benefits of local electricity production and local electricity production when uh, consumption when you essentially coordinate the two processes in such a way that you reduce your dependency on the centralized distributor and in a natural way, similarly to how the processes have evolved in the wholesale or transmission markets, uh, this kind of co-consumption and co-production can help a lot to increase transactivity in the distribution system. And when I say transactivity, I mean uh, monetary exchanges, not only in terms of the value surplus generated <laughs> by different kinds of actors, but also in terms of the overall efficiency. So as soon as there is some surplus, right, it's very reasonable to think about how to allocate this surplus in a certain manner, say in an efficient manner or in a fair manner or in somehow other manner. And from this perspective, what we do very often, we think about these transactions as a sort of retail market. The reason for this motivation is very simple. We can apply different concepts that we have developed in other domains in order to model these interactions at what is now known as the distribution network. However, these traditional concepts are not exactly applicable in this case just because electric power distribution is very unique. If 20 years ago people were claiming that wholesale electricity markets must differ from general wholesale markets because of the transmission physics, right? Right now we can make the same argument that the distribution markets or retail markets must be different from the wholesale markets because distribution network exhibit a strongly different physical nature than the transmission network. But there is some optimi opti optimism for it. The optimism comes from the fact that we managed to design not perfect but a very decent one electricity market and from this perspective we still have to find some uh, obvious flaws. The most important flaw of the wholesale market is the fact that there is still no perfect competition that we so much desire primarily because we have a very limited number of players, right? Another big challenge is that we have non-convexities and as a result of those non-convexities we cannot ensure uh, uh, revenue adequacy in many cases, we cannot ensure incentive compatibility and as a result of that there are uh, mechanisms that not incentivize but make it unavoidable for certain market participants to, um, to, uh, to seek non centrally optimal solution which does not uh, ensure global optimum. Then following the integration of distributed energy resources which are plenty on the transmission level, 
uh, we observe price suppression, which essentially challenges the most fundamental assumption under the wholesale market that uh, producers have non uh, zero production cost, right? Uh, so the more of such producers we have, the uh, more price suppression occurs, and as a result of it, we cannot recover competitive prices, and we have to derive new add-ons to that market mechanism. Another big problem of the wholesale market is that regulators are so good in overseeing it that in many cases that prevent us from fully exploiting the benefits of the market competition. And keeping in mind these four imperfections that we observed in the wholesale electricity markets, we need to project this into future designs for retail markets. And the reason for that is simple. It already exists in some places. One of the most obvious places in the United States would be the state of Texas, because they were one of the pioneers of deregulation, and they have not the market, but a very efficient structure that is similar to it. The other thing is that even though uh, these markets can be implemented in practice, right, there is a great deal of temptation to mirror what has been done in the wholesale market and directly apply it to this context, right? especially given the fact that that's what regulators can do. Right? And as a matter of fact, using the old distribution framework is not going to be efficient. So what a lot of people do at this time, they try to find some kind of uh, alternatives for the retail markets. And these alternatives, they come from different sources. Well, first of all, about the motivation, right? Why do we want to have this retail competition and retail market uh, organized in the first place, right? The thing is that it allows for a greater number of market participants because the entry requirement is much lower, right? When the entry requirement is set to one kilowatt, it means that essentially every toaster that I expect so many of you have in the kitchen can be an individual market participant. And that overcomes the main limitation of the wholesale market when you cannot have a sufficiently large number of players to ensure perfect competition. The fundamental difference of this competition that is going to occur at the retail market, we can already conclude that definitively, is going to be the fact that we're going to depart from the economy of scale principle and economy of scope principle that underlines wholesale operations. Indeed, we will no longer have a bulk producer or a bulk consumer. We're going to have to coordinate operations between a number of distributed assets. And in this case, what we need to make sure is that we know how to match the diversity of features that these distributed agents have. And therefore, the fundamental principle that is going to be viable for this kind of operation is economy of sharing, economy of information. And from this perspective, I had multiple very useful discussions with Jalal about different approaches on how these specific factors can be considered. Another thing which differentiates the retail level from the wholesale level is that we do have means for economic storage, which is not necessarily going to come from a physical energy storage, a battery or, say, thermal storage. It can come in a virtual form. One example of this virtual form can come from the ability to merge different consumers, the different consumption patterns, and view it as a battery. There is a work by Munter Dalek and his group at MIT on how to represent uh, demand consumption profiles as a virtual battery. The interesting thing, and it's a very arguable thing, that when you stack up all of those three bullet points I have, you will realize that they allow a great deal of control. And this control appears to be a little less discreetly constrained than any kind of wholesale control. Primarily, it sounds a little bit counterintuitive because you would imagine that there is a lot of discrete decisions to be made on the distribution level. For example, tap settings of transformers, different kind of switching decisions, and so on and so forth. But these decisions, they're not as much operational as they are recursive. So from this perspective, when you consider operational decisions, due to a small granularity, ability to take advantage of <clears throat> ability to take advantage of the economy of sharing and information, and in large storage capacity, you can achieve a very fine grain control that can be location specific. So from this perspective, distribution networks are more suitable for transactive, ele transacting electricity than the wholesale market. The only thing that we need to do, we need to find a proper architecture that would capture all of those features. 
And from this perspective, we need to take into account multiple challenges that can occur across the way that are not that obvious at the wholesale market. On the transition toward the retail competition, one of the most important things will be to make sure that we have access to the same information. If you take analogy by the wholesale market, it will appear that right now market participants have the same information issued by the system operator. Load forecast, in many cases they uh, share wind power forecast and all other information available about the system. It's very difficult to have the same level of transparency of the retail competition and therefore informational asymmetry will become a major factor. Besides that, there is an important factor that would affect the use of these resources related to the communication overhead. Uh, in the wholesale market, you have hundreds of particip participants, right? If you have a decent retail market, essentially you will have to communicate between your local utility and every toaster in your kitchen, right? Besides that, there is no well-established market auction. It's actually amazing that if you go from one wholesale electricity market in the United States to another one, it will become abundantly clear that they fit one template and that the only difference over there is in terms of certain parameters. There is no diversity, essentially, in terms of the conceptual shift. Here, uh, retail markets will exhibit a greater deal of diversity because they will have to take into account a great deal of specific locational requirements. And besides that, there is a challenge related to the fact that now when we have non-physical producers, the fundamental assumption of using non-zero marginal production cost will not be that valid, especially under high penetration level of those resources. But nevertheless, the competition that you can see at the distribution level when you have a centralized utility which is going to give up its imperative privilege to supply electricity to third-party DR, DR aggregators, it will happen. The interesting thing about this competition is that if the number of aggregators of distributed energy resources is small, we're not going to harvest all of those benefits. Because, essentially, what we're going to have... This perspective, the most important thing that as we go from this architecture, which is emerging right now, and we can observe it in non-trivial forms in many places in the States, even though we don't have retail competition, eventually we would like to have something more fi finer grainer, for example, peer-to-peer -peer interactions. And the main reason for that is that we move from the oligopolistic form to pure competition form, right? And that helps us to fully garnish the benefits of the uh, retail competition. If we just stay here, most likely the retail market that is going to be designed uh, is going to inherit all the flaws from the wholesale market. And if you look at this, right, uh, the process of introducing this retail competition in distribution system is going to have three levels of participants. The first one is utility, right? And utilities are extremely uh, restrictive in that sense and narrow-minded. They infer directly that we know better how to manage our grid. And the word our here is emphasized because by talking to them, I realized one thing. They're very possessive of these wires, transformers, and generators. They think they are ours, means theirs. And they don't want to give up the privilege of managing these assets. The other thing is third-party aggregators. They are willing to fully embrace the benefits of competition. They say, bring it on. And the problem is that utilities cannot get aboard. And in a way, without utilities, they understand that their ability to succeed financially and technically is greatly limited. And there are customers, right? Customers are extremely excited. Wall Street Journal called that there is unprecedented, unwavering public support for grid modernization. And the interesting thing that as you go from utilities to customers, you will realize very quickly that as the amount of enthusiasm increase, the amount of expertise in power grid operations reduces. It's not common for smart grids. It's not unique for smart grids. It's everywhere like that. But in this particular case, the problem is that utilities are limited in their ability to embrace these changes because the more customer and distributed energy resources they have, the more problems they face, and these problems are often formulated as the so-called utility death spiral. If you roll out a customer end DER, it turns out that you consume less electricity from utilities. They generate less, profit, uh, less revenue streams, 
and as a result they have to increase tariff for remaining customers so that these customers have more incentives to roll out their own DRs and so on and so forth. So I don't like talking about the death. So I think the way how we need to perceive it, and that's something that we're doing in my group, we're trying to design a utility resurrection spiral. It basically means that we need to reshift the business model of utilities in such a way that rolling out customer and distributed energy resources would unlock new services and new uh, revenue streams for them in such a way that the more customer and distributed energy resources they have, the more revenue they can potentially collect so they can remove additional integration ba barriers for those resources. And if you think about this in the context of a U.S. distribution utility, you will realize that utilities are currently under pressure to achieve new goals which are not related to the total amount of electricity they supply to customers. Because the old and the current business model is mainly driven by the amount of electricity sold to end customers, right? If you introduce other metrics into this business model, for example, performance or service charges to operate the transmission network, then in this case you will realize that utility doesn't essentially care about the amount of electricity sold as long as they can replenish these fallen incomes. And in order to be able to do that, they need to maximize grid benefits from distributed energy resources. They need to make network extremely flexible in order to absorb all customer choices where the customers want to transact energy between one another or they want somehow store it and so on and so forth. They need essentially to enhance network flexibility. Besides that, they need to engage customers and distributed energy resources into providing auxiliary services for the system, which will make this network transactivity possible. And of course, it creates a bunch of challenges. The first challenge is that the distribution system operators don't necessarily have a clear idea of what's going on in the distribution system. They don't fully observe it. I'm not talking here about behind the meter issue at this point. I'm going to talk about that in a few slides. But what I'm talking here is that even if you take a regular distribution network, the system, the utilities, often don't have a good topology map. How interfaces are connected, what are the parameters of these links, and so on and so forth. Despite the fact that by the year 2021, the city of New York, all five boroughs, are going to have smart meters enrolled in essentially every customer end, we still don't have enough actionable data that would help us to use this information about customers in order to benefit the grid. And as a result of that, when we introduce these two layers, enhanced observability and uh, a finer data sets about customer preference and customer choices, we unavoidably are going to run into the issue of cybersecurity and privacy. Today, I will not deliberately talk about security and privacy, and I will focus on the first two challenges that I introduce. So, as I said, the first challenge is related to the observability, and it has two domains. The first domain is that we have observability in the traditional power system sense, which essentially assumes that we need to have distributed state estimation, and there is a lot of efforts in this area that help you to a, understand better the state of the system and then introduce this uh, information into a sort of continuous time operating paradigm with uh, estimate at the current set point and look ahead predictions, whether it's based on MPC or some kind of other technique, it doesn't really matter. But what matters is that these techniques can integrate uh, the property of being adaptive using local information. So it gives the rise to a lot of decentralized decision-making centers, which is good because the size of the system is such that it's very difficult to manage it at scale. But um, what I like to view more in the term of observability is essentially what happens on the customer end. Because even if you install smart meters in essentially every customer, you still don't have a good idea of what's happening behind the meter. And that's why we need to have what I call behind the meter observability. Basically what I want to see, I want to have a better idea of consumption patterns that are available to us. I want to see local storage capabilities which are behind the meters, and I would like to see the willingness to adjust, which is unique for every cost customer. And the reason why I want to do it, because I essentially want to enable three levels of control decisions in uh, that sense. I want to control an individual consumer, I want to control a group of consumers, and then I would like to control an individual consumer in a group. And the reason for that control is because behind the meter loads, if they're not completely homogeneous, many types of those loads exhibit 
similar features. For example, electric vehicles, right? They can be produced by Nissan, by Chevrolet World, by Tesla, but roughly you can aggregate them within a certain set of parameters and characteristics. A very similar conclusion can be done about thermostatically controlled load. It can be air conditioning units or heating units, or it can be heat pumps and so on and so forth. And the great people from Con Edison, which is the uh, power utility in New York City, they already realized that. So they rolled out what they called a smart AC program. I would not necessarily call it smart because it doesn't have all the intelligence that I'm going to present later on, but I'd say it's not dumb AC. So the way how this program works is very simple. They have an app that you download on your phone and during peak days, say a very warm day in summer, you receive a message which requests you to adjust AC settings, for example, increase temperature by a few degrees, and you can do it. In return, you're going to get some points, which you cannot spend directly. You need to buy a certain gift card of a big retail, not to be named here, and then you can get your benefit. The point here is that um, it includes a lot of things that uh, are not transparent. And one thing is that, uh, first, uh, they treat everyone uniformly. They don't uh, give you an amount of points which is based on the benefit that you deliver to the system. The other thing, they average, right? So if all of a sudden you not help the system at all, right, you will get an average benefit. You're not going to get zero benefit. And from this perspective, that's what is called green of a scene of averaging, right? That undermines the efficiency of the, the whole program. The reason for that is simple. They don't have efficient communication technique and they don't have an efficient way of analyzing their results, how the program performs over time. And that's something that we do by introducing learning. Uh, we help them refine their decisions and we can help them individualize it. This kind of work goes toward the general thrust of motor work, which is cu currently very popular. It says we no longer need data, we need information. So learning in this context help us to make data actionable. In order to understand this way a little bit better, we developed a Markov process framework along with a number of colleagues at Lawrence Berkeley National Lab and at Los Alamos National Laboratory, which is related to the fact that any kind of uh, homogeneous uh, a homogeneous group of loads can be represented using a Markov process through a randomized discrete time, discrete space Markov chain. So what we have here, we have a set of air conditioners, right? So the top row says four states which characterize the on state. The uh, low row says uh, at least four off states. And we have the dispatch range, right? The way how you can think about that in terms of air conditioning is that Moving from state 1 to 4 or from 5 to 8, you change the temperature setting of your AC unit and thus provide necessary power for the power grid. It's interesting because uh, this kind of MDP representation helps to achieve two objectives. It helps you to aggregate a large set of homogeneous load and at the same time it helps you to look into individual resource, control an individual resource and control the entire ensemble. So you can have unique specific signals sent to each consumers and at the same time you can average the behavior of the entire ensemble. It can capture different characteristics so you can adjust it to account for voltage settings, you can adjust it to account for reactive power consumption of each unit and so on and so forth. But mostly interesting thing is that under certain algorithmic solution that I'm going to discuss in a few moments, it helps you to integrate the control of this ensemble, which is located behind the meter, with the distribution optimal power flow. So to control this ensemble, we formulated an optimization problem. And this optimization problem, essentially, it aims to uh, minimize the expected cost, which has two components, aggregated utility of loads, and the discomfort cost. And from this perspective, we want to have an expectation of a control vector raw, which is essentially represents the control decision that a utility or an aggregator would have to send to this ensemble. So the control decision raw is related, as I'm going to show later, to the transition uh, probability matrix. And we have two matrices. 
The matrix with the bar, P bar, represents default transitions. So that's something that we obtain through sampling. So that's how an ensemble would, of loads would behave normally without any kind of signal from the system operator. So it represents default dynamics of thermostatical control loads. Our decision, P here, right, represent the decision that a utility or aggregator sends to the ensemble and that it wants to change its behavior from the default state. And from this perspective, what we really control here, the difference between default dynamics that would happen no matter what, right? And the difference between the desired, preferred uh, dynamic that the system operator would like to infer. In order to compromise between the two, we use the concept of so-called KL divergence. KL divergence help you to measure <coughs> dissimilarity between two distributions, as I have here Q in P, right? And essentially it works both quite well for discrete time and discrete space and continuous time and continuous space distribution. So the fact that we consider here discrete assumption, right, does not limit the application of this KL divergence measure <laughs> Uh, in terms of uh, future transition toward continuous time representations. So this term, which we call discomfort cost, is nothing else but a representation of this KL divergence uh, metric. And this divergence metric is multiplied by a penalty factor gamma, which is essentially the penalty for not behaving as the utility desires it. You can view it as a penalty in case when you don't want to comply with the command and as incentive when you comply with it. Because logarithm, as I'm going to show later, it's nothing else but logarithmic difference between two signals, the default signals and the desired signal. Can you elaborate a little bit about the difference of uh, KL divergence and Wasserstein metric? So what is so Wasserstein is not exactly applicable here in this context because Wasserstein is used to characterize the dispersion of the distribution, right? But it cannot be efficiently used to control the difference between the two distributions. It can be adjusted. So, so yeah. But here you wanna you don't you, you don't really care about individual distribution as much as you care about the difference between the two. Okay. Because discomfort cost, essentially, it's the difference between what the system operator wants you to do and what you want to do on your own. Naturally, when P is equal to P bar, you essentially get zero, right? So from this perspective, there are two, three interesting data-driven aspects. The first data-driven aspect is related to the fact how you randomize your Markov decision process. If you remember on the previous slide, I had four on states, right? And I have four off states, right? I did it for the sake of simplicity. I randomize it in a uniform fashion. It doesn't have to be that way. And there is a lot of techniques showing that this kind of discretization can be done intelligently. The other two data-driven aspects are more fun because look at this penalty, right? Right now, the penalty doesn't depend on the state of ensemble and it doesn't depend on the degree of desperation that the utility is experiencing at the moment, right? Ideally, this thing needs to be conditioned. Beside that fact, uh, value of P bar that I have over there, uh, I assume that I know it with perfect accuracy, so I can model a, be a default behavior of the ensemble of thermostatical lo loads with a high deal of accuracy. It's also not true because from this perspective, it's very difficult to achieve. So what we did, we showed that it works, that this type of ensemble control can work. And indeed, we integrated it into the chance constraint optimal power flow using uh, this ADMM type approach. So this approach controls each individual ensemble using the Markov process optimization we got control signals for the ensemble control. We integrated into the optimal power flow. We solve optimal power flow. We ensure that optimal power flow is feasible. And if need be, we iterate to send proper incentives to uh, the MDP optimization. And when I say proper incentives, I refer to parameter gamma. So depending on the value of gamma, we relate it to dual variables of the OPF solution, and we obtain uh, a very good convergence result. 
We don't have a theoretical result on this convergence, but in practice we see that it goes into stable solution quite fast. And here we have an ensemble control which is distributed over the course of the time horizon, and you can see that for every state, and we have all eight states printed here in different colors, on and off symmetrical, we uh, see more or less uniform behavior which shows the control is really non-intrusive, so we don't change um, customer behaviors way too much. And at the same time, it helps to achieve a lot of uh, grid-centric purposes. For, for example, it helps to smooth out, um, smooth out voltage fluctuation for different levels of uncertainty. The problem with this thing, as I said before, is that we don't take advantage of any kind of data management techniques that might be put in place, right? And the first aspect of it is discretization, right? I do believe that it's not our job as power system engineers to focus in on it because there are a lot of other people in computer science uh, and the CS literature is very rich on it and this kind of work can be done in a case-specific situation based on the needs of a particular utility. But what's interesting is to focus on penalties and default transitions, right? So first, we don't know precise values, as I said before, for either of the two, right? But instead, we can obtain some confidence intervals that can be computed from historical data. And as time goes on, as we use and rely on this program more often, we can learn those things over time. The real question is, can we narrow the gap between the confidence intervals and learning? So within the proposed MDP framework, the answer, we cannot. And therefore, we develop a different chance-constraint-based uh, framework that can accommodate this difference. So if you remember the previous MDP problem that uh, I presented to you, this problem has one beauty. Its solution can be found analytically. So the control decision P alpha beta here, right, is nothing else but a function of the input parameter which are already available. And they represent a behavior of this individual agent of the whole ensemble as a ratio to the behavior of the entire ensemble. That makes it possible for us to invoke one very interesting property, that this analytical control policy that we derive here for the entire ensemble can be implemented in two ways. First, it can be adaptive, and it can be, at the same time, local. So every agent will have to act based on the local information. However, this local policy, as you can see, does not depend on penalty. It depends on P bar only. So the only thing that in this local policy we will have to adjust is related to the fact that we want to depart from the assumption that we know P bar with a perfect accuracy. And we consider two cases how this can be done. The first case, oh yeah, and one thing is that for both cases, in, under some assumptions, we were able to find analytical solutions. The first case is the stochastic case, so we assume that our P bar bold is now a random variable which is parameterized with a deterministic P bar value plus some, uh, some noise, right? And under these assumptions, our stochastic case can be given as this objective function where we compute expectation not only over control decision rho, but also over uncertainty omega. From this perspective, right, uh, what we can do, we can say, okay, this is the stochastic solution and computes the average, but we also want to be protected against the worst case assumption. And that's where we go into so-called robust optimization by formulating so-called mean-max problem, right? So in terms of dynamic programming, we can write it down as supreme over a certain set D, where D represents an uncertain set. I deliberately don't specify how to formalize this set just now, because it depends on the solution. So based on these two formulations, the stochastic one and the robust one, we were able to obtain two analytical results. The proofs are a little bit messy and difficult to present, so I'm going to spare you this. I'm just going to present the end result. So in the stochastic case, right, when we have the stochastic case, the control policy is given here. And as you can see, that under this assumption, the only difference from theorem one, when I presented 
there is this policy for the deterministic case, right? The only difference in, in these two terms, right? So essentially, by adding these two additional terms to previous control policy, right, we can robustify our solution for the average case, right? When we go into the robust MDP, what I want to achieve in this case, I want to get the worst case expectation. And that's actually a very interesting case because in addition to this assumption on omega that it follows a zero mean normal distribution, I have to make a rather restrictive assumption on uh, the uncertainty set D. I say that uncertainty set D is within a certain upper and lower bound. And these upper and lower bounds, they can be computed using the Cauchy-Chi theorem. And under this Cauchy-Chi assumption, we can get this analytical policy where you can see that the difference between the deterministic case and the previous case, again, in these two exponent terms. And if you analyze this term against this term, right, uh, the difference, the robustness, will come from only one term. You will have the upper bound of your uncertainty set here versus variance up there. Okay? And both results in theorem 2 and theorem 3 they have essentially the same property as theorem one. They can be implemented in a local manner, and they can be adaptive. So uh, one of my first papers in interpretable transactions on power system was related to hybrid approaches, where I combined an interval optimization and stochastic optimization. So for me, it's pretty natural to design a hybrid control problem when you have your worst case objective, and you have your expected objective, and you sort of weight them using uh, different coefficients. And that works quite nicely. So what you can see here is the difference in our control decisions row for naive, stochastic, robust, and hybrid cases. So the interesting thing is to look at the hybrid decisions right here and to realize how disruptive they can be to the entire ensemble. So you can see it from, like, you know, the general curves of the shapes, right? So hybrid control is something that is, occurs over the entire horizon. We don't have a delimiter here across the temporal axis. So it may elect to be a little more intrusive than the robust and stochastic control that just parameterize against uncertainty. And it, when it comes to the, uh, to the hybrid control, you can see the changing parameter eta naturally changes the conservatism of this solution. And of course, when eta is equal to one, you get the expected case, the stochastic cost, and when you get at equal to zero, you get the worst case solution. So what I have shown so far is that MDP framework is not only suitable for being integrated in the optimal power flow, it can also reliably accommodate a rich set of statistical assumptions on the distribution, and it can essentially robustify the MDP solution against this assumption. What I don't like about those assumptions is that in both theorems, theorem two and theorem three, I made an assumption that my uncertainty follows a certain distribution, normal. I don't want that anymore. So the next step we did, we look into a more generic uncertainty set D over here, right? Which is parameterized as in terms of empirical moments. So you have empirical moment of a distribution here and you have empirical standard deviation which will limit to be within a certain scalar constant B and a certain scalar C relative to a given empirical variance. So when we look at this, we try to find an analytical solution to derive a very similar analytical policy that can be adaptive and decentralized, and we failed, right? So if there is someone in this room who can derive it, please let me know, I'll be very curious to look. But I believe that going further down with distributional robustness and neglecting this assumption in the corner, in the top right corner, doesn't have an analytical solution, so we ha will have to, to handle it algorithmically. We were able to reformulate this problem in this way, where essentially you again have the min-max problem, where your uncertain parameter belongs to this complex uncertainty set. We solved it using a standard replacement of the inner maximization with, the, with its dual and so on and so forth. But the problem was here, we look at the results and they're very extremely conservative. 
So we started looking into the way how we can reduce this conservatism, and the answer came. I just to make sure I got it. So you have an exact moments here, right? Yeah. Okay. So you have an exact moments, but you don't make an assumption on the distribution. So we obtained the solution. It became very conservative. We got very upset. We decided to take a look at the literature again, and we came to the same to the same discussion we had in the morning. Uh, we decided to formulate that now we want to robustify against distribution C, right, which is obtained from a Wasserstein ball given the radius here, right? And then we made this reformulation. It attained this form. Uh, the reformulation process is very simple. It's based on the replacement of the inner uh, optimization with its equivalent dual. And following on that, we solve this problem and we obtain the following results. First, you can see from the control variables over there that this control is really not very intrusive, right? The control signal is very smooth and there is no drastic transitions. And at the same time, changing parameter, the, the, the radius of the Wasserstein ball help you achieve and reduce conservatism of this solution. So what needs to be kept in mind here, right? That robustness can be achieved by means of analytical forms, or it can be achieved algorithmically. It's up to us to decide which approach to follow. Of course, algorithmic approaches, as expected, provide a higher degree of controllability over the conservatism, but there is a beauty in having this decentralized adaptive local policy that can be implemented essentially at every toaster. So we look at this. And we realized, OK, we can achieve observability and control. We can refine customer data. But one fundamental assumption that was made before is that we treat every member of a sample equally. If we depart from this assumption, right, if we abandon it, we can no longer achieve analytical results. And we can no longer achieve analytical solution that easily. If we cannot achieve analytical solution that easily, it becomes very difficult to relax Wasserman ball control. So it becomes more difficult to implement. And as a result of it, there are some computational issues. That's why we decided, OK, is there any other way to look at this problem? And there was a way. We wanted to look into distribution optimal power flow in such a way that it becomes more data driven and that it makes data actionable so that we can use this data in operations and to design compensation. And that drastically changes from what, what it's a drastic change from what I described previously because the compensation can now be individualized based on behavioral patterns of each uh, consumer. I would go very quickly over here because I imagine that everyone in this room more or less know what chance constraint is. So up here you have deterministic or hard constraints which are enforced in optimal power flow formulations quite often. So you can put it into the probabilistic chance constraint fashion and what the chance constraint problem will do, it will relax the hard deterministic constraints into softer constraints by integrating this term which is computed based on a certain probability assumption. And depending on the probability assumptions you make, we can, we can regulate the degree of softness. The motivation for this work actually came from something that we did multiple years ago at Los Alamos National Laboratory. We analyzed wind speed patterns and we realized that they're heavily driven in terms of their uh, standard deviation is driven by their expected value. So that's a very important thing because the standard chance constraint doesn't help you to account for this relationship. And we need to account for this kind of uncertainty because if you have different mean error, you're going to have a different standard deviation of that error. It's very well illustrated on this linear scaling that establishes the linear dependency between the mean wind speed and its standard deviation, right? So you can see that the weakness of your spread here in terms of the mean value affects the spread of your standard deviation, right? So it's not only important to account for the mean error here, right? It's also important to account for the covariance error if you're talking about the multi-location multi or multi-temporal case in general. And we were able to solve this problem. 
So we formulated a min-max problem, which is based on chance constraints, and that allows you to make this min-max reformulation into analytical form under the same Cauchy-Chi assumptions that I described previously. So what this assumption specifically mean? It means that your empirical variance, right, is nothing else but a function of the number of samples you have and number of errors that you observe based to the relevant cases. The more cases you have, the more precisely you can estimate this variance. And actually, when you compare the assumption that you make, say, on a normal distribution against empirical data collected here, the conclusion is uniform, that the more data you have, the more accurate variance estimation you can provide. And the way how it's achieved is actually through computing the uncertainty set on the variance bounds, right? So that depends, this equation, for the upper, for the lower and the higher bound. And this is an illustration how the variance depends based on different value of robustness that you want to enforce. The last plot here shows how in this data-driven RPF we can uh, parameterize not for a single normal distribution, right? but for a family of normal distribution depending on the color. So for a different level of robustness, you're going to have a different area set. So this approach worked quite nicely. And we obtained the following solutions. This solution so the level of violations. You have a deterministic curve up here. And you have the uh, acceptable tolerance based on the assumptions that we made on solving the problem. And in every case, the violation that we observe in terms of compliance with voltage limits, which was our major concern in the MDP formulation, it was far below the acceptable level and it was far below the deterministic level. We didn't even have to invoke the full level of robustness. In terms of the cost that you can observe here, we were just slightly more expensive than the regular chance constraint solution. So essentially, this data-driven distributional robustness came with a certain cost, but it provided compliance with the limits, better compliance with the limits. So we were looking at this and we were thinking, OK, can we make better than this? Because chance constraints are good, but it's sort of like, you know, everyone knows it, right? Every PhD student, first year, second year PhD student, read at least one paper on chance constraints. So we want to see whether we can improve over it, because we wanted to reinvent ourselves. And that's how we came up with this framework for learning. We saw a clear connection between learning, meaning the ability to improve our knowledge of the parameter, and data-driven RPF in a way how it handles distributional robustness. And uh, one of the students in my group, Robert Meath, he came up with this closed-loop learning RPF structure. So what he does, he has two sets. Lambda t and he t. These are historical data sets that represent a collection of prices lambda and collections of demand response observations. The way how it works is that a utility sends a signal to a set of distributed loads, price signal, and then observes the response to that price. It collects information about prices and responses over time, and then it's able to determine what is an ideal response function for every customer is. Then based on this parameter estimation, we can use this information into the optimal power flow model with demand response in such a way that we improve deliverability of demand response over time and it helps us to reduce the operating cost because we don't have to overestimate the amount of demand response. And another property that we observe in this that we wanted to have in this optimal power flow problem is that we really wanted to co-optimize demand response with other distribution system generation assets because right now demand response programs they sort of work independently they're not co-optimized so first this utility runs a power system based on its normal uh, procedure then they realize aha we have a problem and then they send a signal for AC units to reduce their production. So the key idea here is very simple, that we want to minimize the expected cost on the OPF given energy provision, demand response remuneration, 
and profit of selling energy. That's a typical formulation for U.S. distribution utilities. And the key component is that we want to compute proper price signals. And the key word is proper. In terms of the U.S. distribution regulation, proper means something that would represent network, account for network sensitivities. And one way to do it is distribution locational marginal prices, which are being currently uh, implemented or on the way to be implemented in New York. There is a lot of difficulty related to it, but I'm going to spare this discussion. So what we did, we say, okay, we're going to invoke parameter estimation model for our demand response, and we will come up with a linear model. So what we say that the amount of expected demand response here is denoted as X is going to be a function of lambda, which is a price signal that a utility sends to demand response participants. And even though there are many ways to model this kind of interactions, it turns out that for a variety of reasons, linear model is the best one. And this linear model is, of course, a function of price. So if you want to learn the reaction of demand response participants, all you have to do is to find parameter beta and parameter beta 1. And price lambda is your control decision in this case. Based on your knowledge of betas, you can find such lambda that is going to give you this expected response. And how to know that it's linear? Uh, great question. So uh, in practice, it's sigmoid. But uh, the, sigmoid, uh, the, the sigmoid function has limits on it, right? So we model it as a linear, assuming that there is no saturation. So it's consistent with so-called small signal analysis. So we assume that perturbations delivered to every customer is fairly small. The more interesting question, Jalal, is why variance of this response doesn't depend on price. And that's something that we were surprised to learn when we did uh, when we researched the literature, it turned out that apparently variance of response is not driven by the price. Variance of response is driven by latency. So uh, latency here is driven by the fact that a lot of loads are thermally inertial. It means that if you receive a signal to reduce, say, your AC load, right, and it will happen instantly, right, that's what you would imagine. You change the setup instantly. But actually, for a C load to finish the cycle, it will take some time. The way how it intuitively can be viewed is if you all of a sudden switch off your dishwasher, right? It will not stop right away, right? It will go continue its cycle. Beside that fact, there is a lot of noise related to human to device interactions. So there can be delays of different kinds. And that's why sigma does not, uh, variance does not depend on the price. So the actual error that we want to robustify against is shown here, and the error is between what you expect in the ideal case minus the expectation which is computed right here. The problem, again, is that you don't know parameters bad. So in this case, what we want to do, we want to compute the observable demand, the demand that would include the response of the demand response participants, and it's going to be your given forecast, d bar, minus your linear response model presented previously plus the error. And when you look at this, right, we see that this error, it can integrate both the noise, which is due to latency, for example, and the natural forecast error. So when we learn this information into data sets on the utility end, we don't have to itemize between the factors that contribute to the error. Because by taking the difference between the actual demand and the demand forecast, we can integrate this error into the desired response. The last thing is that we also have an additional error term due to the fact that so far we assume that using this learning curve, right, we will be able to estimate parameters better exactly. In practice, we don't know exact value of parameters better will only have will only have approximate value and that would invoke the last error term due to the misestimation so when we lump together all of those error terms we want to have a learning design that would account for those even so the first equation doesn't count for refund effect right say it again uh, i mean 
if we reduce the, uh, the power consumption of demand, maybe later, next hour or next two hours, they will increase. Ah, oh, okay, rebound effect in so terms of replenishing your giving up. Yeah, it's kind of shifting. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We, we don't account for it. So okay. we, we don't account for the rebound effect, yeah. Just, you're absolutely right in your observation. Okay. So, but the point that I want to make is that this is the error that we want to sort of have in our distributionally robust optimal power flow. And this is parameter that we want to learn. So a high level view of how we do it is shown here. We observe the errors at every time step, right? And based on this error, we can compute empirical mean of the response and we can compute empirical covariance among the responses. Using this very simple least square estimator, we can obtain this data reliably. And the most importantly, that in the regulatory landscape of US power distribution systems, we can have this information available to the utility. Then we can use this information to construct metrics omega, which is empirical metrics, that can be used in turn to formulate distributionally robust chance constraints. Distributionally robust chance constraints, they overcome assumption of normal distribution and they essentially allows us to take into account correlation between nodes. Why is it important? Because from our empirical analysis of data, it follows that covariance has a significant influence on the optimal solution. And from this perspective, uh, we can take it into account, which is particularly important for distribution systems because neighboring nodes are likely to exhibit a certain degree of correlation in their behavior. So from this perspective, if you look at this constraint, which is now distributionally robust, it also will have a conditional value at risk interpretation. Because what we want to find, we want to find the minimum value of decision variables such that ensure that this constraint is held with a given level of confidence. And this actually, when we derive this, we realized, okay, it's too much like Daniel Kuhn. We just need to go research his vast literature and found how this constraint can be reformulated. Because we tried first with standard second order cone reformulations and we were not able to find anything neat. So what we did then, we found a closed loop expression for uncertain voltage here as a function of deterministic voltage plus error and control variable alpha. Alpha is a control uh, response policy. Then we were able to reformulate it into an explicit CVR form. And uh, the reformulation was based on the assumption that the CVR needs to find a slack variable introduced into the deterministic constraint that would ensure a certain level of confidence. So we reformulated this constraint as shown here in such a way that we find the minimum value of x such that guarantees that the magnitude of this term is no bigger than a given value. And this kind of constraint shown here has exact semi-definite reformulation presented in one of Daniel Kuhn's paper right up here. So what you can see here is that we introduce an auxiliary semi-definite matrix and two constraints which are linear in that matrix. Oh yeah, and by the way, this operator with brackets, it's trace. So based on this reformulation, we were able to replace the original distributionally robust constraint with SDP constraints in our optimal power flow formulation. So that's a very interesting result because we didn't use SDP for, say, representing AC power flow. We use it via linearization, but we used computational resources needed to solve SDP problem for representing uncertainty. And given the scope of work that many people do in this group, I challenge you to think what SDP should be used in this context. Should it be used to represent AC power flows or should it be used to represent uncertainty? Because in both cases, you can achieve these goals. Maybe both? No, then it's too complex. <laughs> Let us assume you can pick only one, okay? Um, so just a few results. We considered a small feeder Shown up here, it's actually the same feeder that Anthony Papavasilu used in his paper where he analyzed distribution, locational, marginal prices. 
And we consider four cases when we don't have network constraints, when we have only power flow constraints, when we only have voltage constraints, and when we have voltage and flow constraints. So the yellow color shows that uh, demand response resource is available at that node because the vertical axis is node and the horizontal is time step is always used. As you make your system more constrained, it becomes more difficult to use demand response resources and eventually you only use it toward the uh, very remote ends because they cannot fully leverage other resources. And we also compare four cases which reflect different knowledge of information. Perfect foresight, meaning you can estimate prices via parameters beta and uncertainty via metrics omega accurately. You have partially oracle case, we call it beta oracle case, when you can uh, know perfect sensitivities and when you can have an omega oracle case when you can have perfect estimation of uncertainty. And we have a perfectly oblivious case, which is the reality that what we want to learn. So given this result, we were able to compute prices for each of the cases. And the most interesting thing is that you can see that over time we were able to see a pretty decent convergence in price signals for different nodes in the system. And we also were able to see that with the exception of node 1 and 12, right, there is no price spikes. Node 1 and node 12 have certain spikes because of their proximity to distributed energy resources, so they cannot exactly learn it quick because they have so-called price shocks. It's related to the fact known as incomplete learning. But the relative difference is not as important as the accuracy of the price signal because we can now introduce locational sensitivity to price signals that we send to uh, demand response participants. And the last figure that I would like to show is related to the fact that as we have more learning data available for different cases, beta learning, omega learning, and full learning, right, we eventually are able to reduce the error relative to the oracular case in terms of the impact on the objective function. Still, we have different decisions, control decisions, because the problem, underlying problem is, uh, has more than one minimum, right? But the difference in the objective function over time reduces to zero. And that happens not only because of learning, it mainly happens because we were able to seek the merge between the learning and distributional robustness. As you can see, as the difference between these two cases and these cases. Because as time goes on, you see that the blue and yellow mark, uh, and orange markers, they tend to depart from the green markers because green markers are the most consistent here. So I want to wrap it up here. I went above my time because of the coffee accident, but I hope that I still was able to present everything you wanted to hear. So again, behind the meter state estimation is very helpful to improve power system operation. We need to have data-driven operations, and we need to have online or in some literature it's called dynamic learning. A lot more things are going to come, and we're working on those things. And most importantly, you're working on it too, so let's see who's going to do it better. We have deeper ideas on customer engagements, whether it's going to be through P2P platforms or customer-specific incentive that exhibit a greater deal of locational and temporal and behavioral sensitivities than DLMPs. And we also have some work related to effective distribution auctions because we want to know the value price of information. And here information I mean as oracular versus robust knowledge of the system. We work on how to ensure that network is being treated as a fair resource for everyone, how we factor in the value of network on operations of demand response aggregators and peer-to-peer -peer platform. And we are working on the topic of auction completeness, me meaning that we have an equivalent of revenue adequate market because again, in case of finer grainer, less discrete distribution system operations, it's more desirable to achieve because you don't have to deal with non-convexities imposed by those. Again, I would like to thank you all for your attention. I would like to thank NSF for supporting my research. And I would like to thank Jalal for Jalal, Spiridon, and Pierre for having me here. So in terms of references, these papers are out. This paper was just submitted, and uh, its early version will appear on archive, I believe, in a few days because it takes some time. 
So I'll be happy to handle any questions you have, and thank you again. Oh, the cube, yeah, the yeah. cube. Who won the cube first? Uh, I didn't get what you mean. Uh, oh, just to make sure that everyone will get uh, non-negative revenue, do you mean? or uh, Auction completeness comes from two things. First, you need to make sure that consumer surpluses are, and producer surpluses are sufficient. And another important feature here is that we don't exactly know how to achieve it because we don't know what the products are. One product is obvious, it's the amount of electricity sold, whether by a utility or an aggregator. The other aspect of the problem, whether you're going to charge for network usage in general, how are you going to do it? Based on temporal base, or you're going to have some subscription, like a monthly long subscription, right? Whether you're going to charge for regulation services, whether you're going to change for reactive power support, and so on and so forth. So completeness comes not only from matching the revenue streams of two sides, but also from exploring different kind of ways to, to generate them. So different services dur during, during pricing schemes, yeah. We've been working on bandit rationality related to demand response programs. And so we tried to explicitly find some models that can show uh, how consumers actually react to prices. And um, one of the models that we proposed is, was to consider some uh, dead band. So for example, if the price received by consumer is like smaller than some amount, like let's say $3 per kilowatt or whatever, it would treat it as zero price, right? Okay. And it will treat it as some positive price if the signal sent from DSO is higher than that. So, and I'm wondering if you can account for these kind of uh, models with the uh, linear um, models that you assume? Yeah. Uh, well, I probably can, but why would I do it? I mean, uh, my objective here is to inspire you so that you write your own paper and cite me, right? <laughs> <laughs> no, yeah, it's a fairly good question because indeed the assumption that we make here is um, related to the fact, um, where is that? that uh, we use the linear curve, right? And uh, indeed, what it turns out is that there is uh, some dead band area for sure, and you can integrate it. Again, one example, as I said, would be a sigmoid function, but dead band, I mean, you mean in r around zero values too, right? It can be done, uh, and it can be fairly easily done because there is a lot of literature even in the power system context. One example would be dead band of governor response, right? You, when you have a speed um, droop governor, uh, people model both dead band and the saturation area, so yeah, it can be done. The problem is that you're just going to have more parameters to learn. Here, the beauty of this model is that there are only two parameters, and it provides a lot of insights. It's a way of thinking, uh, because uh, uh, it seems that uh, if you actually integrate like lots of data, you can learn it even having two parameters. Like. Uh, yeah, and actually it comes from the fact that apparently it turns out that the value of this parameter on the optimal solution is not that great. It's mainly this parameter that fits it. Another important point to make it across this line is that theoretically this value should be equal to zero, right? It's pretty straightforward because when you have zero price signal, you should receive zero response, right? But due to the learning aspect of the problem, when we are not looking in to find the best model, possible when we find the best fit model, right? We achieve best results when this parameter is non-zero. So, and that's actually a factor that can be leveraged toward estimating the sensitivity, not the sensitivity, but the weakness of the dead band. Yeah, well. um, I'm wondering how you could add, uh, maybe you said it earlier, how could you add the uh, delay of the contraction into your model so you could uh, account for the this effect? The way how we integrate this is related to the fact that, uh, let me find, where is that? 
through the definition of this error, right? This error, it's not only your inability to forecast, right? It's also the inability to account for different kinds of latencies that may occur on the customer end. So we don't model the latency in time domain as the factor that changes the capacity delivered. Does it make sense to you? Not, uh, not yeah, there is no... Exp so let me answer it more blatantly. There is no ex delay model here. There is only the effect of delay on the capacity delivered. Another question is related to, um, so I'm working on demonstrating this uh, stuff, but how in real life you were, you were mentioning homogeneous and uh, heterogeneous group mm -hmm. of uh, appliances. So would you say by default any appliances in real life it's heterogeneous or? Yeah, I would say the majority of leads are heterogeneous, but you can find a specific set, subsets of loads that exhibit more or less homogeneous properties. For example, EVs, air conditioning or heating units, those, uni those units, even if they are produced by different manufacturers on different continents, they're pretty, diver uh, they're, pretty, uh, they're, pretty, they're pretty similar in their dispatch potential. Uh, take a toaster, my favorite example, right? The cost of, like if you have the toaster, right, the capacity of this coaster is going to be between 0.7 and 1.9 kilowatts, right? So it's more or less an aggregated amount. And the time the toaster works, right, it's from one to like multiple minutes. So from this perspective, you can make this aggregation. Same works for air conditioning because air conditioning setting across, say, a building, right, is going to be the same. Um, it's going to exhibit some sensitivity based on choices, right? But those sensitivities are not going to be that great between, say, the first and the tenth floor of the building. But when you go into a higher level aggregation of loads, for example, an urban neighborhood or even the city, right? Uh, of course, it becomes more and more difficult to find the common core among different loads. And that's why distribution robustness invoked in the chance constraint framework is the way to go because you can no longer randomize it using MDP. It's not the reason why we developed this framework, right, in the first place, but it's an additional motivation to use it. MDP is good, say, for utility-specific programs when we want to have, like, say, all air conditioning in New York being operated uh, as an ensemble. That would work, right? If you sort of take not a utility-based program, but you just take a utility that wants to send price signals to, loca to, to specific locations, then you have to assume that loads are heterogeneous and you have to generate signals not based on their unique features, but based on their aggregated behavior. It's just another level of hierarchical control, essentially. Um, wait, I mean, this is, of course, I understand for aggregated demand response using smart appliances, but have you ever thought about using a similar model for behavioral demand response where you don't talk about a specific appliance in general, but you could model an ensemble of people consuming mm -hmm. loads at different times? Uh, it's, it's a very good question, but we are looking into it in my group under a slightly different angle. We don't look into controlling human behavior because it sounds like a dirty CIA conspiracy theory. Of course. We are looking into matching their behavior. So one thing is when you send a signal to control something, right? The other thing is when you just have default patterns, right? And you try to analyze how you can complement those patterns in such a way that they either amplify effects of one another if it benefits the grid, or they mitigate the effects of one another if there is a need. And you can actually try to have it in a closed loop manner so that you can also some kind of indirect incentives. Yeah. But we're working on it. The problem here and that's actually probably going to be of interest to you, is that uh, privacy concerns are very specific. It's very difficult. The beauty of ensemble control, right, is that you can characterize individuals without knowing their specific behavior, right? As soon as you go into the scheme you proposed, right, you will unavoidably have to deal with individuals. And privacy concerns would be probably uh, something that... Um, is going to be a dead bolt on this technology. Yeah, thank you. But it's a good way to try.
Feel free to ask. No. Any question else? Can I ask the last question? So at the beginning, you talked a lot, I mean, about the regulate, I mean, the utility level or retailer level markets and the fact that it's coming. Then we are adding this nice data-driven based techniques, uh, distribution and robust optimization. But how do you see its applica applicability in the sense that, I don't know how much it uh, affects uh, the transparency of the market, how much the market based on this kind of data-driven methods will be transparent for all the market participants. Uh, based on all the experiences that you have with uh, the New York utilities, uh, how do you think about the applicability of this kind of methods in future? So I don't, uh, I don't have much experience with New York utilities. I only visited three or four of them, and there are, there are, there are tens of them across the state of New York. Uh, but I do work closely with uh, New York regulators, and I do get their insights. The way how they view the impact of these technologies is that uh, this kind of technologies are going to give by us time, while utilities can improve their energy efficiency through it. It's going to buy us time to understand what kind of uh, retail market we are going to design because um, one of the major problems is that right now utilities know about the system everything and regulator has no other option but to trust their judgment. Uh, probably it's not the best way to do because in this case if we open proceedings to design a retail market right now it will be um, Unav unavoidably designed in such a way that would favor the current utility perspective, which is which is something that we would like to avoid. So the pers the overwhelming uh, consensus that I believe regulators in the state of New York have is that right now we do what's best to improve efficiency of utility, and later on when we have a better understanding of how it affects the grid, we're going to use this experience towards introducing the competition. But there is a lot of work going on. For example, distribution, locational, marginal prices. Uh, there is a lot of work related to incentivizing utilities to switch their business model from selling electricity to providing services uh, as network operators. There is a lot of work that incentivizes uh, energy efficiency on the utility and, and uh, that incentivize performance of the utility. So it's gradually going to be integrated in the rate design. Very good. Thank you so much. Uh, thank let's you. thank again uh, Yuri. Uh, thank you.